Well, good evening and praise the Lord, everybody. As they would say, everybody in the body, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to the New Bethel Church Life Impact Bible Study. Today is November the 16th, and we are in for a wonderful, wonderful lesson. I am your facilitator, Pastor LaShawn Rutherford, one of the staff pastors here at, our, at the ministry, and our senior pastor is none other than the Honorable Bishop A. Glenn Grady, and of course, Lady Angela Grady. We honor them on tonight, and look who has an opportunity to be before the people. Look old me, and I am so grateful to be with you on tonight. Now, what I need you to do before anything else, I need you to like, to share, to subscribe. If you have not already subscribed to our YouTube channel, we need you to do that. We want you to stay current on the things and the videos, the stuff that's going on in the ministry, but we need you to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you are never behind on, on this video content. So not only that, but we need you to like it, share it, share it on your Facebook page, share it on your Instagram and all of your social media account. Let everybody know, hey, I'm going to Bible study right now. Uh, don't disturb me, but you can come in and join Bible study with me. So put it out there. Come on, let's go into Bible class. Well, uh, as you know, if you've been listening to us, uh, if you've been listening to us anytime throughout the year, you know that our theme for the year is this is the year to celebrate. I don't care what's going on in your life, what has gone on this year. Sometimes the things that we go through try to convince us that we don't have a, 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 a need to celebrate or Things aren't feeling well, so let's not celebrate. They're not going the way that we, we think they should go. But let me tell you, the scripture in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18 says, rejoice always. You can stop right there. That's a word for somebody that's watching right now who's been struggling with this thing. Rejoice always always in the good, in the bad, when you're up, when you're down, feeling well, feeling sick, whatever the circumstance, the Bible commands us to rejoice always. That's why the, the scripture says in everything, give thanks. A matter of the fact, after it says rejoice always, it turns around and says, pray continually. Pray continue. Back, back in my day, they used to say, keep a prayer wheel turning. So uh, keep that prayer wheel turning. Know that the fire is burning. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. So what, what does it say? Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So we want you to embody that. I know that we're almost at the end of the year. Look, Thanksgiving is next week. Can you believe that? Thanksgiving is next week. I'm not ready. I'm not, I'm not ready yet. But it's, it's, it's right there upon us. Time never waits for anyone. It keeps on moving. It keeps on going. And we're already at the end of the year, and I'm going to proclaim it until the end. This is the year to celebrate. Well, I have the great opportunity of being a member of the board for the NBC Community Development Corporation. Matter of the fact, I was one of the previous presidents of the board and president of the organization from 2016, 17, 18, and 19. I was the president of the organization, but now I sit on the board as a board member and I am an advocate for whatever's going on with our community development corporation. A uh, matter of the fact, it was all started and birthed out of the New Bethel Church Outreach Ministry. And God blessed it so much till it became its own community development corporation. Well, this Saturday, this Saturday, 
On November the 19th, it's our annual Celebrate Life and Good Health event. I don't want you to miss it. I want you to put it on your calendar. I want you to plan to attend, tell your friends, tell your, your family members. This day, uh, we become the hands of God. We are the body. You know, we can be the hands. We can be the feet. This day, we're going to be the hands. And we're going to deliver to the community through this event uh, items from our pantry for a Thanksgiving meal which will include your choice of a turkey, ham, or chicken uh, while supplies last. So we want you to get in that line, get in there early, get your chicken, turkey, or ham. Hey, when I was growing up, we didn't always have turkey and dressing. Sometimes we had chicken and dressing. So we want you to get in the line. And not only that, will you get... Will, food items, but you get household supplies sponsored by the uh, Urban Community Connections, the UCC, which is another organization, the CEO uh, of that organization, leader of that organization, also works with our Community Development Corporation. So they're partnering together with many other community leaders, the Community Health Council, Vibrant Health, uh, Alive and Thrive, Midland Care, I mean, you name it, they're all going to be there to supply health information, food products, uh, household products, and if you have not received your vaccination by now, we all might have uh, received vaccination, but there are a number of people that still have not received their vaccination for COVID-19, so we want you to come out, get your COVID-19 uh, vaccination. Maybe you're vaccinated already, but do for a booster. You can get that booster as well at this event. I know my booster is overdue, so I will be in the line. I'm going to get my booster this Saturday. So we want you again to come out and join us this Saturday from 12 to 2 p.m. Uh, and if you would like to volunteer, volunteer slots are still available come out, help out, and let's help the community that we, God has placed us in. Well, if you missed last Sunday's message, if you missed service last week, or you didn't get a chance to watch it, I want you to go back into the archive, go back into the YouTube archive, pull this message up from Elder Litany Gray. God moved tremendously. It was a power-packed wonderful word from the Lord, and you need to hear it. So go back and pull that up and listen to it. It was entitled, Live a Seek for Life and a Song for Eternity. My God, for glory, you need to listen to that sermon. So go back and, and hear that. This month of November, our Christian Education Department uh, our Sunday school, our ministerial alliance, we all got together and we have been putting a concentration on our foundation. So you've been hearing foundational messages, uh, even beginning with uh, Bishop Brady, who started it off, kicked it off with uh, understanding uh, our foundation. And I was thinking about that thing. I live in a subdivision. They're kind of building new houses all around. And there's a row of houses where they, they poured the foundation, they've let it settle, and they've begun to build the homes. A few weeks later, I noticed that they stopped construction on one of the homes. And I wondered what was going on? Why haven't they started continuing to build on that? The, the next thing I knew, the uh, dump truck was there and the tools were there and they were digging up the foundation in a certain spot because somehow there was a crack in the foundation. I don't care if you are a, a new convert into Christianity, you're a new convert, or if you've been walking this thing for years, sometimes you got to do a foundation check. You got to check to make sure your foundation is right. A matter of fact, Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27, I put it in the message version here for you because it reads so well. The word of the Lord says, these words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life. 
or homeowner improvements to your standard of living. Oh my goodness, what we've been teaching is not just a paint job, it's not just a patchwork. What we've been teaching this month in November, the Bible says they are foundational words. Words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on a solid rock. It's so important to have a good foundation, but after so long and after that foundation has been there for a while, sometimes you need to make sure that uh, nothing has come along and there's been some eroding of the ground and it's caused some cracks in your foundation. So you got to go back and revisit. What am I standing on? Am I standing on a firm foundation? Verse 25 said, rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like, now I didn't say it. This is the way this message version reads. It says, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. So we've been doing some foundational checking so that we can make sure we are fixed to the rock. Last week, you had an opportunity to hear from uh, Pastor John Mark Talbert, uh, who taught a wonderful dynamic Bible study in our life impact session that dealt with what's in your DNA. He talked about the doctrine of mankind or humankind. So again, you can even go back and listen to that. It's all been a journey. So we started off talking about the importance of a foundation, then we moved on to teach uh, the doctrine of mankind and what's in, in our DNA. Now we're moving on to the subject matter, saved. One word, saved. Tonight we're going to deal with the doctrine of salvation. Uh, or soteriology, that's the study of salvation, comes from the Greek word soteria, which also means save, salvation, to be rescued, to be brought out. That's what it deals with. So that's what our lesson is. That's what my assignment is on tonight, is to talk about the doctrine of salvation. When I first uh, seen the title, the one word title of save, it made me think about uh, those instances where you were like, uh, you know, you better be glad I'm saved. You, <laughs> that person better be glad I'm saved. Well, we want to see about that on tonight. Let's talk about it. So it's not consequent, uh, a consequential thing or by happenstance that I chose the picture that you're seeing where you see that hand looks like it's rescuing somebody who's drowning in water. That is a really good pictorial view of what it is to be saved, what salvation really is. The person in the water cannot save themselves. They're drowning. They're drowning and they're reaching up for some help, somebody outside of the water has to pull them out of the water. That's, that's what salvation is. Salvation can be very, very uh, uh, integral. It can be very uh, detailed. There's a lot involved with it. It can really get really, really deep when we talk about the doctrines uh, of salvation, very theological uh, schooling type of things, but we want to make sure our people are knowledgeable of what we believe as it relates to salvation and God. So what is salvation? I put it in red here so that you can really see that salvation is the overriding theme of the entire Bible. This whole 
Bible from cover to cover is a love saga between a God and, and his creation and the love that he has for that creation. Salvation is the theme of the entire Bible. The, all the stories, everything from front to end deals with God's redemption story of mankind. So the, the, the definition can be very, very complicated, but we've brought it down to uh, uh, its simplest form. Salvation in its simplest definition is to be delivered or rescued from peril. It is to be saved by God from the consequences of our sin. The whole nature of the word salvation depicts that someone is in trouble and needs to be rescued. That's what salvation is. It is uh, us being saved or rescued or pulled out from by God. Now, I highlighted by God because Salvation is not something that we do. There is the God side of salvation, God's viewpoint of salvation, God's responsibility as it relates to salvation. But then we'll also discuss man's part on salvation. I probably didn't hit that up there when I put that on that, that main page, that's what that's how we're going to flow tonight. We're going to talk about God's part. We're going to talk about man's part and that whole process. So I highlighted that because God is the one who saves. We, we don't have the power to save ourselves, just like the person in the water. We're in it. We can't save ourselves. So we need God to save us. So in the previous lesson with what's in our DNA, uh, we, that's what brought us up to this point is that we need God to save us. Save us from what? The consequences of our sin. So what our sin did uh, when the in the fall, in the garden, when man uh, decided to disobey God, it, it had a very, very uh, deep, long-lasting ramifications on mankind. When Adam and Eve fell and decided to disobey God, it, it came down to all of us. What do I mean by that? Uh, their choices, what they chose as being the very first um, man and woman, mankind on the earth, it was transferred to all of us, had some grave consequences. Now, in this picture, you see that sin separates us from God. That's really what the fall did. In the beginning, mankind was created perfect. When God created Adam, uh, they were created perfect. Now, God created Eve from Adam. But when God created Adam, he created Adam perfect. He had two natures. Mankind had two natures. You had the nature uh, to sin or not to sin. It was a choice. You, you didn't have the I can't help it. Uh, you, you were able to choose what you wanted to do. You could choose to sin or you could choose to obey God. And we see that happening in the Garden of Eden when Adam chose to partake of the, the tree, of the fruit of the tree. So consequently, Romans 3 and 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody birthed into this world is birthed into sin. Nobody is born sinless that's born of a man and of a woman. Now, we're going to get into it later on in this lesson where we do meet somebody who knew no sin. Oh, you already know who he is. But, of course, all have sinned. Nobody is perfect. Nobody. Mom, dad, I, I don't care the best 
living person that you know in your life is still as filthy rags. We have all sinned and fallen short. Psalms 51 and 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. It is something that you have no choice of. So when man partook of the fruit in the garden, it put us all into a one nature category. Before the fall, we had two natures, again, to sin or not to sin. And now, after the fall, judgment has come upon man. And now everybody birthed into this earth realm is birthed into sin. You no longer have a choice. You're birthed into sin. I don't care how innocent and cute the baby is, the baby is born in sin. Oh, they're innocent. They're innocent. Yeah, but they're still innocently born in sin. We're all born into sin. Romans 5 and 12 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So it had a, a consequence. There was a judgment pronounced on man that of death. Now, that's a physical death. We know the physical death, but there's also the death where there's a separation between man and God. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. What is the judgment? Romans 6, 23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord, or Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what sin did was put us all in the category of being separated from God. Our sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 verses one through two. Now this whole Bible study is full of scripture. So I want you to brace yourself. It's not one of those lessons where we, we get to read one and just build off of it. We have to give you the scriptures. Follow the word of God so that you'll know that this lines up with God's word. What sin did was drew a wedge between man and God. A matter of the fact, after he sinned, God drove them out of the garden. There was a wedge between them because God is a holy God. He's holy and he cannot have sin in his presence like that. So it drove a wedge. It drove a wedge between us. And the judgment on that was death. Not only physical death, but a eternal separation from God. That's the other definition of death is eternal separation from God. When a person dies physically, they are uh, it's when their soul is separated from their body and the spirit. Mankind is, is three parts, body, soul, and spirit. When the soul is separated from that, that's a type of death. That's what happens physically. Spiritually, that's what sin does in our lives. It causes separation between us and God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 through 2 puts it in, in plain context. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot say for his ear or his ear, his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your sin has separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. That's what sin does in our life. That's what sin did in the garden. It separated us from God. 1 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9, the word of the Lord says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. There it is right there, eternal separation from God. That was the judgment. But God so loved the world 
Aren't you glad you serve a loving God, a God who knows how to find a way? Even though we were, the judgment on us was eternal damnation and destruction, everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, eternal separation. God loved his creation so much that he has to now find a way to reconcile us. Now, we could go into a lot of theological terms that deal with reconciliation and uh, propitiation, justification, uh, and all of those things, but you're going to hear the definitions of those within this lesson, but we won't, we won't go too deep on those. It can take Salvation can be several lessons long. I mean, you can deal with just one aspect in one Bible study by itself. So we're hitting on these things, but know that we can go even deeper into a lot of this subject matter. But again, sin separates us from God. The judgment on that is eternal destruction, everlasting destruction, eternal separation from God. But God loved us so much that he finds a way. Oh, that blesses my soul. When I say it, it just, it does something in my spirit. Love finds a way. God's love for us found a way to uh, save us. So, in Hebrews chapter number 9, verse 22, I want to read that in the English Standard Version. It says, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. So what happens, uh, what's happening now is that after the separation, God says, now I must find a way. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So he begins a search. Who can redeem mankind? Who can save mankind? Noah couldn't do it. He could only save uh, uh, the, his family, and that was only through God because salvation belongs to God. He's the one who saves. So if God is the one who saves, nobody else born into this world is perfect enough to be our blood sacrifice, to be our sacrifice, to save and redeem us, then God himself solves the problem. God solves our sins problems. What does he do? Let's read the scripture. John 1, St. John 1, verses 1 through, through 4, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the Word was God. So in the beginning, we understand that the Word is with God. The Word is literally, it's God. God is His Word. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life and that life was the light of the world or the light of all mankind. So we understand that God is the word. Verse number 14 then says, the word, God, was made flesh. So that means God had to say, how will we redeem him? I'm gonna have to do it myself. So God, the word, becomes flesh, and the Bible says, and dwelt among us. The word, our Emmanuel, God with us. He wraps himself in flesh, dwells among us, and the scripture says, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Who is the only begotten of the Father? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Jesus that's how God enters into the earth realm is as Jesus Christ. The word is made flesh. God is the word. God then wraps himself in flesh, dwells among us as the only begotten of the Father, Father full of grace and truth. So what Jesus did for us is he took our punishment. 
God wraps himself in flesh, dwells among us as Jesus Christ, and he, he sacrifices himself. Where there was once a gulf or a, uh, uh, a wedge between God and man, what the work of the cross actually does is it builds a bridge between God and man. Now we go back. When we accept God, accept Christ as our Savior, we then go back to being two natures. When we are saved, the process of salvation, it brings us back into a one nature creation where we no longer have to sin. It's now back to a choice. You now have a choice to sin or not to sin. He builds this bridge through the blood of Calvary that connects us back to God. That's what happened when the veil was rent in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, where we now have access to God through the blood of Jesus once again. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin. Remember earlier I said nobody is birthed into this world uh, without sin except for one person after Adam. After Adam, there's only one who was birthed. And when God came into this earth realm, he came in not through the conception of a man and woman, but it was God who overshadowed Mary with the Holy Ghost so that he could be birthed in. So for so when it says that he knew no sin, he was born different. <laughs> he was born different. Even though he was all uh, he was all human mankind, he was also divine. So for he made him who knew no sin, he walked this life and did not did not sin, had no sin in him. He was the perfect sacrifice. God said, I got to come down and sacrifice myself so that I can reconcile my people back to me. Again, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. First Peter 2 and 24 says, who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He bore the sins of the world on the cross. Uh, Romans 5 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did it for you and I. This is God's uh, side of, plan of, of the plan of salvation, of the doctrine of salvation is the work of the cross, how it reconciles us back to God. 1 Peter 3 and 18 says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That's what he did. He built the bridge that brings us back to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. That's what happens on God's side. That's God's side of salvation. But then we must ask ourselves, what must we do? What must I do to be saved? Jesus has done the work on the cross. God has done that side. It's, it's done. It's complete. The plan is there. But now what must we do? What is a man's part? We have a part. Because see, well, we'll get down to it. We have a part. Acts 2 verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Meaning, what do we need to do to be saved? Who? I know God did the work. I know Jesus uh, he died on the cross. He shed blood for our sins. But what is our part in this 
process. Because again, salvation is a process. It is something, it's not something that you just do and then it's just there. No, no, no. Salvation is a process. In Philippians 1 and 6, the word of the Lord says, I am sure of this, that he who began a work, so there is a beginning process of salvation. There is a continual work of salvation. But as the scripture says, he began a good work in you. He will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So there is a completed work of salvation. Now, this process, uh, we can get into some heavy theological terms like predestination, and we deal that deals with God's foreknowledge, his choosing before uh, the foundation of the world, him knowing who's going to choose him, who's going to be saved, and knowing who's not. And I always tell people, uh, you don't have to, because if we can really get into a, a, a debate uh, in the scripture where people will say, well, if God, God already knows who's going to be saved. God already knows uh, if I'm going to be saved and if I'm not and da 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 and, and that's not really how that works. God in his knowledge, he's all knowing. He's all powerful. He's limitless. He was before anything was. Everything begins with God. God is all powerful. He knows that if you choose left, he knows the outcome. If you choose to go straight, he knows the outcome. If you choose to go right, he knows the If you go backwards, he knows the outcome. He's an all-knowing God. So quite naturally, he knows that whatever choice you choose, he knows the outcome before the foundation of the world. It's not so much that uh, he says, I want you to be saved and I want you to be saved. No, 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 no. You, we think of it in the wrong context. God knows and gives man a choice and he knows that if he chooses me, I know the outcome. I know the outcome if he doesn't choose me. He knows from any direction or dimension the outcome. So in Ephesians 2, 8, 2, 8, and I want you to go back and read these scriptures, we're providing it to you, but we just don't have the time to expound on everything. The word you'll see in that scripture where we have been saved, you'll see that. And then when you go into 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, we'll, we discuss about us being saved. So we're talking about the process of salvation from a theological standpoint is the past the present, and the future works of salvation. Now, we haven't, if you're listening to this, you, you haven't crossed over yet. You haven't, you haven't reached the day of judgment yet. But in that great getting up morning, uh, when we face God, when we, when we cross over from this life to, to eternity, salvation, the Bible says, is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Then we'll move forward to the completed work of salvation. That's from a theological standpoint. But what is the process of salvation for you and I right now? What must I do to be saved? Salvation is not a one-step thing. Salvation has a process to it. Uh, there are steps involved with the plan of salvation. Uh, and we've listed all the steps right here. You got to believe, confess, repent, be baptized, be filled, forsake, and walk upright. But let's talk about them one step at a time so that you can get a clear understanding of what we mean by the steps of salvation. Step number one, you've got to believe first. We call that faith. Uh, the definition of that is uh, complete trust or confidence in someone or something. That's what uh, believing is. That's what Faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It is to put your complete trust in something. When I used to teach the teenagers back in the day, I used to explain to them that when you sat in a chair 
you have complete trust in that chair that it can hold you up. So you don't even give thought to whether it can hold me up or not. You have complete trust in it. So you don't sit lightly. You go ahead and sit down because you're sure that that thing can hold you up. That's what faith is. That's what believing is. Even if you're backing up to the chair and your eyes is not necessarily on the chair, when you sit down, you know that that chair is going to hold you up. Faith is something of the same sort. It's complete confidence and trust in God. Hebrew chapter number 11, verse number six says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Step number one, you have to believe that God is. You cannot be saved if you do not believe in the God of salvation. So number one, you've got to first believe that he is. John 20 and 29 says, Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet they believe. That's you and I. Uh, we didn't walk with Jesus. We are not one of the, the, the disciples or the apostles who saw him face to face. We, we were not back during that time. But Blessed are those who have not seen but yet believe. In order to be saved, number one, you have got to believe. Everybody say believe. Put it in the chat window. See, I haven't had you all do that this whole time. Put it in the chat window. Believe, 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 believe. You've got to believe. There could be a whole Bible study just centered around the power of believing. People's bodies have been healed because they, they, they believe. They had faith. Uh, people have gone through traumatic experiences where uh, their limbs were not working. I mean, there are countless uh, testimonies out there and in instances where people were paralyzed. But the power of belief, believing that they'll walk again, believing that they'll get up, and faith without works is dead. So what happens in the process of salvation is just because you believe, that's not, the, that's not the end all to the process. Believing and having faith puts feet to it. If you believe, if you have faith, then you'll move on to the next step. The next step in our salvation process is to confess. Uh, there's a, and I remember doing a, a lesson on the power of confession, what we speak out of our mouth, what we say. So uh, that holds a, a great weight in the salvation process is that you've got to confess, you've got to acknowledge, you've got to agree, admit Jesus is my personal savior. I believe in the power of the cross. I believe the work of what Jesus did on the cross and the shedding of the blood for me. I believe that there was enough blood shed for me at Calvary that can save my soul. Romans 10, 8 through 10 says, But what said then? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith. We just talked about that, believing in faith, which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made where? unto salvation. So this is one of the steps in our process of being saved is not only do we have to believe and have faith, but we have to confess it. Say it. Confession. Step number three, after we confess. Now, the Bible says we must then repent. What is, what is it to repent? What is it? What is repentance? Uh, the definition of that is to think differently, to reconsider, 
to turn away from. And I like this, this definition here, a turning to God that goes beyond sorrow and contrition. <laughs> uh, the Bible says a broken and a contrite spirit, he cannot, he cannot deny, but it goes beyond that. Repentance is a turning to God, a turning to God to think differently, to reconsider. And uh, and I've heard people say to make a 360. No, it's not to make a 360, because when you make a 360, you just end up in the same place that you were. But when you repent, it is to think differently about. You make a, 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 a 180. And you're facing the opposite direction. I am no longer going to walk in the direction that I was going in. I'm walking toward God now. I repent. I'm sorry. I am I'm broken in my spirit. I want to be saved. That's what repentance is. Repentance is so important that the Bible says you ought to repent daily. Every day, you ought to turn away from take uh, uh, inventory of your life and turn away from those things that separate us from God, those things. And sometimes it's a, it's a work. You got to work that thing out. You have to turn away from and practice it. Walk the different direction. Acts 17, 29 through 30 says, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to Think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now, now, today, now commanded all men everywhere to do what? To repent. Even John baptized unto repentance. Repent for the kingdom is at hand what repentance is, which takes us on to the next step. After we repent, we got to be baptized. We have to be baptized. The baptism, for some, you know, they say it's just an, it's just an outward sign. It's just an outward expression of what happens inwardly. But baptism is essential. Everybody say essential. It is essential. It's so essential that even Jesus was baptized. And if he is our example, then if he was baptized, what more say you about us? We need to be baptized. What is baptism? The definition is to make well, fully wet or immersed. That's why we don't sprinkle. We immerse you, we, we uh, immerse into the water, fully wet. That should be an E-M-E. That should be immersed, um, typo, correction, immersed in the water, to plunge, to wash, ceremonial ablution. Uh, that's what baptism is. So we take you down in the water, fully wet, and bring you back up, as they say, in the newness of life. Acts 2, 37 through 41, I didn't put it all on here, just this excerpt that says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. How do we be baptized? He said, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the remitting or the removal of sins, that sin that you were born in, the sin that uh, Adam put us in. When you are baptized, you are now baptized. And when you come out of that, sins are now remitted. That's a given. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Here at New Bethel Church, we baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, just as the apostles did. The apostles baptized in the name of Jesus. So here at New Bethel, we baptize. We are an apostolic church. We uh, follow the doctrine of the apostles. We baptize in the name of Jesus and all of them understood that the power was in the name of Jesus. Galatians, let's look at it. Galatians 3, 26 and 29 uh, through 29. It says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you 
as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Tell somebody, I put him on when I got baptized. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all on the same playing field. We're all one in Jesus Christ. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is where we deal with the uh, theological concept of adoption that puts us into sonship status. Woo. Oh, and heirs to the promise, hallelujah, brings us into sonship. Acts 4, 12 through 13 says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. They thought these men were unlearned. They marveled and they took and they took knowledge of them that they had been in Jesus. That, that could be a sermon titled by itself, I've been with Jesus. I remember giving my life to the Lord, going down in the name of Jesus. I got baptized. The Lord then filled me with the gift of the Holy Ghost, which we're talking about next. And when I came out of there, oh, I had been with Jesus, the whole household. I was filled with the Holy Ghost in the back room of my aunt's house, kneeling down, praying beside a mattress at night in the middle of the night and when I came when I when I got out of that thing the whole house was there I mean it's like early off in the wee hours of the morning because we started praying at midnight wee hours of the morning everybody's up and they could perceive that I had been with Jesus and I had got saved over a summer at the age of 13 that's when uh, I gave my life to the Lord at age 13, I was filled with the Holy Ghost at age 13. When I got back home from summer break, they perceived that I had been with Jesus. When I got back to school, they said, something is different about you, Sean. Something, something is different. You're different. They started calling me deacon, <laughs> deacon at school because they had perceived that I had been with Jesus. When you get home, when you get home after service on Sunday and when you're in your life, can they say, I perceive that there is something different about you? You got a glow about you. There's something different about the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you carry yourself. Have you been with Jesus? Oh, Lord, I love it. I've been with Jesus. Step number five, we must be filled with the Spirit. This is the Holy Ghost, the dunamis, the dunamis power. You need, you need Elder Green to talk about that. The dunamis power of God. Uh, the definition of that is to make well. Uh-oh, that's wrong. That's, that's, oh, we got that. That's, that's still on there. No, no, no. Well, we'll just tell you, to be filled with the spirit and the power of God. We'll make that correction and, and put a definition on there. But that's what the Holy Ghost is. It is literally God inside of you, stepping inside of you. After Jesus ascends uh, into heaven, he says, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you a comforter, and that's going to be my spirit living down. The comforter cannot come unless I go, because he's coming back to live on the inside of you. And that is the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why he said, greater works shall you do. Oh, you've seen miracles, but wait till I get on the inside of you and change you. You're going to see greater things, the power of God living on the inside of you. Acts 2 and 4 says, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that's why we have to make a quick distinction here that tongues is not the Holy Ghost. It's the sign, it's a sign that you have been filled with the Holy Ghost, but it in itself is not the Holy Ghost. But it was a sign that they had been filled with the Spirit of God. That's what the Holy Ghost is. 
And in and, and Acts 4, 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. In this salvation process, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, with the power of God. In the Old Testament, God was with them, but now God wants to live on the inside of you. He wants to be in you. And not only that, he wants to fill you with the power uh, of God. And he said, you'll be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. And I often tell people, people all the time that... Uh, the Holy Ghost is not something that uh, is just a little sideshow. No, it's essential. You need the power of God to live in this day, to live and be witnesses of God, of the power of God. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You need to ask for it. If you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, you need to ask God, God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. I want to have the power of God living and and walking in my life, working in the inside of me. After you're filled with the Holy Ghost, step number six, and we're coming to go, we only got one more step after this, is to forsake, forsake, to say adieu, to bid farewell, to renounce, to leave uh, of the old way that you were living, the old walk of life. Now, when you become, when you give your life to God and you're going through the steps of salvation, this is a very important, important step because I have seen people turn and, and go back to the same atmosphere, the same folks hanging around the same people. And before you know it, one is going to draw the other. Either you're going to draw them or they're going to draw you. Sometimes you have to go through a moment of forsaking uh, that old lifestyle of yours. I don't do that. You got to walk away from some things. And I remember uh, sitting in a service and, and Anthony Evans, he's a singer. He's actually Dr. Tony Evans' son. He was doing worship that Sunday and he said, I, God had spoken to him and gave him a revelation. He said, when I was going up in the plane, they uh, told us that we need to turn off all of our electronic devices because it could interfere with our connection or the pilot's connection and their electronic devices with the tower. He said, and in that moment, God just, just really gave him a revelation of what it means to forsake. He said, while you're going up to a certain altitude, there is a time in your life where you got to leave some stuff, some people, some situations. You got to leave those things alone because where God is taking you in the out in the altitude, you're on your way up and you don't need any interference with your connection with God. Oh, so that's what it means to forsake. Luke 5, 8 and 11 through 11 says, when Peter, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus's knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished in all that were with him at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. Remember, uh, Jesus, when he calls Simon Peter, he tells him to cast his net on the other side. This is that situation. That's what's going on. The, the, the nets have been overtaken. There's so many fish, they're astonished. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Your Bible might say, I'll make you fishers of men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all to follow Jesus. Some things you have to forsake in order to follow Jesus. You got to leave some stuff back there and say, I am walking in a different direction now. I'm leaving that alone and I'm pursuing God. Now, if you get anything out of today, pursue God. And the last step in this salvation process is to walk upright. Man has a responsibility to live for God, to walk uprightly, to have moral standard, integrity, to walk in truth without blemish. Titus 2, 
11 through 12, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So all of these steps bring us up to now we got to live right. We got to live right. And uh, that's why we we walk out our salvation daily. We walk these things out. We are living for God on a daily basis. And like I said, some stuff, you know, I've heard it explained, you know, when a baby comes to, you know, is learning how to walk and all that stuff, they're crawling, they're climbing up on things, they're taking some steps, but they're continually falling that's sometimes how it is when you're walking out your salvation. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. It's just it. Jesus knew that. God knew that. That's why he died on the cross for us to give us a chance to repent and walk after the things of God. So you have to walk out and work out your soul salvation. That's what we mean by walk, walk upright. You got to practice a holy lifestyle. If it were not so, then that means that once you can you give your life to Christ, you can just go live any other any type of way you want to live and still make heaven. No, God forbid. You have got to live holy. You've got to walk up again. Now you have a choice to sin or not to sin. But the great thing about it is there's blood at Calvary. I got I can repent every day and turn away from continually every day working on myself to turn away from the things that separate me from God or that displeases God. So every day of your life, you've got to walk upright. Tell somebody, you got to live right. And that's what it means to uh, be saved. That's the process of salvation. All seven of those steps, let's go back and read them all together. The plan of salvation, believe, have faith, confess, repent, be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, forsake this world and live right. There you have it. That is man's responsibility in this process of salvation. I know that we have reached our time, so I am going to end it here. I hope this blessed you with the doctrine of salvation. We have talked about God's side, and we've talked about man's side, and we have gone through the process. Of course, there'll be more lessons on this. Like I said, salvation is a big topic and can be, uh, and you can spend a whole month just on uh, the doctrine of salvation by itself. So I hope we touch some things. I hope you learned some things. I want you to be blessed. Again, I want to see you this Saturday, November 19th, for Celebrate Life and Good Health. God bless you. And yours is my prayer. Amen.